So I guess this kind of leads into like how I started bodybuilding because it actually, I think it's kind of funny um, how I started it. So, so I, before then, I mean, I had trained a little bit. I did track and field and a little bit of football. I never actually played, but it's like they're like conditioning and stuff for track. So, but I did like the basic like gym bro stuff like you're like 16 year old does. So I did like machine like and climb flies like every single day mixed with like pull ups and curls and like a course like max it on a bench every other day. All right. So <laughs> that's what. That's why I did originally. So I don't count that as really like my start because that's just, uh, and plus I was eating like hot wings and like ramen noodles like every single day. Like it was like purely like high school. Right. So, um, got into college and then I started out, um, originally. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, COVID hit and I went home and, I was kind of wanting to change slightly how I was going to look because right before COVID hit, I was going to go on vacation and it was like a spring break type of thing. And I was like, dang, I don't look the best. So I was like, I kind of want to like, don't take my shirt off and like have to like flex yeah. like the entire time I'm there on the beach. So, um, started doing it. COVID hit. And then I had to, um, you know, not do that anymore. Cause gym's closed. I went to the YMCA gym was closed. So I was like, dang, I was about to get started into it. Like, Which one like, did you go to? By the- it was the Shepherdsville one. So okay. So they closed it down, actually. Gotcha. My sister worked there and everything, and then they ended up closing down completely. I went to the uh, <laughs> southeast one for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. See, like, so like the YMCA at that time in my place, like, it wasn't big or anything like that. Like, the, I know the YMCA really, one of their, they like, appeals like the water mm. um, and the pools and stuff. But, like, we went to a hotel next door because of that, because ours was kind of, kind of small. Hmm. Um, but yeah, before then, like I had go in and train like after work for like an hour and stuff. So I guess the kind of the desire was there, but I never really did anything with it. So COVID hit and then I just kind of like, just kind of like let myself go. Like I'd be at work and then I would go to my meal for dinner and then I would walk over to Zaxby's and get like 10 piece wing with like spicy fried mushrooms. Like it was not body milling at all. So I would do that, and then um, the gyms opened back up, like, I think 2021, no, 2020? Yeah, 2020, like, May or, May or June, July, one of those, it was in the summer. So I signed up for Planet Fitness because the YMCA closed down, and I kind of just, you know, wanted to get back into fitness again a little bit, and I then I started telling my mom I was like I'm gonna make my like lunches every day, and I was like oh, I'm not gonna be one of those people who like counts every calorie. I'm not gonna like you know plan every meal out. So just like want to make sure like one meal is healthy. So I started doing that, and then me and my friend would go in like eleven o'clock midnight on like bucked up like woke AF like <laughs> it'd be midnight and we'd be off like six hundred milligrams of caffeine, and we would do that for like an hour or two and then actually over time like i guess just out of like when i started getting infatuated with something i really kind of dive into the research and really like ball hard on it so i started learning a lot more about training and about nutrition so i did like kind of like a if it fits your macros type of plan yeah so i did that and i started actually seeing some changes like relatively quickly so, because it, it was kind of similar like that as far as, like, losing body fat when I did track and field. Because mm. um, I was a sprinter and a jumper and stuff like that. So, gotcha. um, yeah, that actually started seeing changes there. We were going to go on vacation, like, that next year. So, like, early 2021. I think it was, like, May. Oh, uh, we were going to go on vacation. So, I was, like, and then also this time I was also thinking about maybe doing bodybuilding. So, I was, like, you know, if I'm actually seeing changes quickly, like, I might, and of course, this is somebody who, like, didn't know anything about the sport. Like, a lot of people think, that, like, they say, like, when they grow up, like, they see, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger and stuff like that, like, and they see him. I didn't even know who that was. I mean, I knew who it was, but, like, I didn't know he was a bodybuilder That's until funny. I actually got into bodybuilding. <laughs> like, I didn't, like, I didn't get exposed to it at all, really. So, like, my closest thing to a resemblance of a bodybuilder was, like, Sylvester Stallone like I was it and I didn't even know like I didn't I thought he was a bodybuilder it turns out he's the only one that wasn't a bodybuilder <laughs> so uh so yeah we I did like a mock prep uh which turns out to my first prep was nowhere near prep uh so I did that and I was like yeah I think I have a structure for it 
I was researching. I remember being in the Planet Fitness locker room, like researching like classic physique, like figuring out what even the difference between all three divisions were. Um, so because I was like, they look the same, and of course, you know, before you start out, it's like everybody looks the same. Mm-hmm. And it's not until you really get into it you start seeing like the differences in like shape, structure, stuff right. like that. So, um, yeah, I went did like that mock prep for vacation and stuff like that. I was still like maybe like ten percent body fat, so it was nowhere near a prep. And started like dirty, yeah, dirty bulking all through twenty one, and I put on a little bit of weight on that. But um, then I started thinking like if I'm gonna really do this, like. I need to figure out what kind of show I'm wanting to do and then what kind of coach I might want. Cause I'm, if I'm going to do this, like I want to actually like do good. In it. So, and that's just like how I am. Like if I, even if it's something I'm going to do little in, like just barely, I still kind of like look at coaches and stuff to see how I can get better. So, uh, I decided like, I want to do like a natural show. So I've done like mainly almost all natural shows so far. So like Kentucky natural classic was like the first thing that popped up. And I was like, oh, that's perfect because it's like it's, it starts off the next April, so it was like, like June ish. So I was like, I got time to you know put on some mass real quick, mm-hmm. and so that's when I started looking for a coach. And then I was looking through, and I, I literally typed in like, I think it was Kentucky Prep Coach, <laughs> and of course, like you know Steve Weingarten, who I'm with now, yeah. is handles KY Prep Coach. So that's the first thing that popped up. And Good so, marketing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, it was the first thing that popped up on Google. So, like, I looked at that. And then he also had a, um athlete who also went to my school. Um, so I, I DM'd her. I was like, hey, how do you like him? Like, like what? how much does he usually charge and stuff like that? Which, of course, for her, she got an earlier, so her rate was a little bit different. But, like, I was, like, kind of testing my options. It was either him or somebody who, like, I was looking at Kyle Wilkes at the time too, like before he got big, like, cause now he does like all the influencers and stuff like that over in like Houston and LA and stuff like that. So I was looking at him back when his rates were like two twenty five. I'm sure it's like way above that. Yeah. Now. So, so I was looking at those two and I was like, you know, Steve's a little bit closer. He's in Louisville. I can like, if I wanted to go do check-ins, like I could go to his house and do it to where Kyle, like I'd have to like, take pictures, video, or whatever, even if he even accepts me and stuff. Like, right. So, and I wrote a message to Steve, and I was like, you know, would you would we be able to do this? He was like, yeah, I think we can make this work. Um, so we ended up getting together, like, what was it, uh, October, November, even with my plan and stuff like that. And that was my first experience going through prep. Like, I went from, like, not knowing anything about the sport to just jumping right into it. Gotcha. And so that's when I ended up, like, finding out, like, the most, cause like I said, I researched a whole bunch. So, like, I was watching, like, past Olympias, I don't know, classics, like, all that stuff. And that's where I really started actually getting a love for posing, too, at the time, too. So, that's when I think I first stumbled across Frank Zane. And, he, of course, he's, like, one of my biggest inspirations, him, Logan Franklin, um, Ed Corny, stuff like that. Um, so, I saw Frank Zane's Olympia. And I was like, dang, like, this is who I kind of want to be like. And so, actually, my first posing routine I ever did was modeled after his um, one of these days routines. Ended up doing that show uh, that following April in 2022. Um, they fairly well for, like, being a new person in there. But then I, I really realized I was like, yeah, I have the discipline for this. And this is something, like, even on, like, the day that I don't love it the most – um, because of course some days I'm out of it a little bit more than I am others. If, if I'm sitting there thinking, if the least intense feeling about the sport is that I like it, then that's a pretty good thing. Right. So that's not something <laughs> I want to get off. So yeah, it's, since then it's just um, me and Steve's been good together still, improving more and more, adding more size conditioning, and and so actually after this after that year, like I said, focused more on the posing and ended up winning a uh, best posing award. Uh, this past April with the Kentucky Natural Classic. So, yeah, that's pretty much where we are now after this end of the year. Posing, obviously, is, a very, is a very important aspect of bodybuilding. Um, but the individual routines, to me, were just something to be, be in awe of, just how creative and, like I said, just the fluidity, the dynamic of it, and just how it was almost like a dance, too. 
Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, I think of it almost like in the same aspect as art. So, like, actually, in one of my past routines I did this past um, fall, I actually modeled a couple of the poses off of like, um, like Greek sculptures and stuff like that. So, because um, I, I, I've been looking at pay, previous routines, um, like Logan Franklin's Arnold Classic routine, Cedric Millen's 2017 Arnold Classic routine. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on lines and reform. And so I was, I, like I said, like, it's funny because somebody looked at my phone and they looked at my, like, my camera roll. I was scrolling through and they're like, why do you have like, just like pictures of like sculptures and stuff? Like, like I'm like nowhere near art major or anything like that. So it's like, oh, I'm just like, you know, like how it looks. But it really was just me like looking through and seeing poses because that's ultimately like what we kind of strive to look like is like Greek gods, which have sculptures of them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for sure. Like it's it's funny too because a lot of like the best posers I know previously like were either dancers or they danced mm-hmm. some way or um, like even as a kid like I danced all the time. We have VHS tapes of me just like <laughs> dancing and stuff. So it's funny how that kind of translates into being able to have a sense of like fluidity from one pose to another and yeah, um, yeah. Of course, like static poses like in your like quarter turns and stuff that's where you see like the muscularity and stuff, but you'll see the creativity in the individual routines. Yeah. Rather than just like left, right, here's your front. Let me pump the crowd real quick and then fist pump. Let's get off. Yeah. You know? Are you a personal trainer, online fitness coach or gym owner on the verge of burnout? Are you wanting to grow your fitness business, but can't add more hours to your hectic schedule? Introducing trainer revenue multiplier, the premier wealth creation system For fitness professionals that helps you earn more and work less, visit www.trainerrevenuemultiplier.com today to schedule your free business accelerator session. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level, schedule your call today. You mentioned doing a, like doing it in high school, just just like being a part of this sports world and maybe working out a little bit but for you was which one was really kind of your more of a main focus was it kind of like let me be athletic and be in that sports world or was it let me use the sports world to to train and to do those things like what really was the main goal for you then so like all throughout my life like i'd always been in sports in some way or another so like my dad was in MLB for a bit so of course i got into baseball like as soon as i grew up and um, I loved baseball, uh, basketball a bit more than baseball, so I switched over to basketball, and actually I, I started track because I was actually getting recruited for track and field, and the only reason why I started track and field was because of ex-girlfriend, and we ended up breaking up like a week after I got in there. So, and it, I mean, I still stayed in it because I was like, oh, I started the sport, I'm going to finish it, and so it ended up being like the mom's favorite sport in high school. So... um of course, my mom's mom was a uh, collegiate, like, high jumper. Or, no, she was a, uh, I forgot what it was. You jump, you jump over things while you're running to. The hurdles? Hurdles, yeah. She's going to hate me for forgetting <laughs> that. But, um, yeah, she was a collegiate hurdler and stuff like that. So, kind of had track in my blood. And I was going to go track and field f- to center college for it. But I kind of didn't want to be, like, so far away from home. So I just went to Bellarmine instead. And I was like, I'm not making the Olympics. So like, I'm not going to like <laughs> devote your life to it. Yeah. Like I was like, I'll, I'm fine. pausing it right here. And, uh, that's where I still kind of, you know, found myself, I guess kind of wanting to be an athletic in some way. So, um, you know, I was, I wasn't in any basketball leagues at the time. So I was like, I kind of want to do something. So I would like just do random classes at the YMCA because you know how they have like those random like karate classes mm, and stuff like yeah. that. So, um, yeah, I, I switched to just maybe going there because I think it was because my dad and my mom went and trained one day and I was like, yeah, I'll go too. Because I was old enough at the time now. So I was like, yeah, I'll go and do it. So I did the, and I was also in a athletic conditioning class. And then, so I was like, all these big guys are, you know, they're benching like 225 and stuff like that. At the time for me, it was like unheard of. Like, I was like something I was shooting for. So, yeah, after high school, it was pretty much the only way I kind of stayed active. And even then, it was like I'd go for like one day, hit chest like way more than I needed to. 
didn't even touch legs. Um, and then maybe run on the treadmill for like five minutes and be like, oh, yeah, we killed it today. Was it just mainly aesthetics at that point? I mean, being a young guy, that's that definitely powers a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I'd always kind of had a uh, a sense of discipline, I would say, because um, that was just always instilled in me growing up. Um, so that's that's where came where it came from in the aspect of, like, when you start a sport, you have to finish it. Mm-hmm. And with track and field, after being looked at by colleges, it really opened my eyes to where I was like, because I really didn't have too much of, like, track and field instruction either so i was kind of just like on youtube winging it and i was like if i really want to get somewhere i really have to put my effort forth because i can't just say i want to you know i want to be this and then somebody be like i got you like i have to like really see that out so like even now like when i talk to like steve and we uh discuss like information that we've seen and like training styles we see online right now these days and stuff like that. Like when he mentions like a name, I'll go and research everything that person said. Like one, for instance, would be like, we talked about Chris Aceto one time and then he mentioned that he took a lot of his, uh, ideas from him. So I, I went through, I kid you not all my YouTube, like watch history. If you look up Chris Aceto, all of his podcasts he's been on all watched through. Um, uh, because I really want to see the source of information that my mentor has. Yeah. Um, I want to know where my teacher got their information from. Um, so, but yeah, um, I always kind of had that sense of discipline. And yeah, at first it kind of was the aesthetic look of it because I was like, I, want, I don't want to be like the worst looking one on the beach right now. So, I mean, it wasn't like I was like necessarily like a heavy person, but from an aesthetic standpoint, I was nowhere near the first. So, um, and then once... I feel like I started seeing a potential into it. I was like, I would kind of hate to have the potential to do something with this and then just like throw it away. Yeah. Cause I, I hate seeing people who have like, like the best potential to do something and then just kind of don't care about it. And you're like, dude, you're like a, like a huge what if story. Yeah. And that's not necessarily saying that I'm a big what if story, but it's, it just so happened also that I happen to love what I do as well with it. So, for me to also like see the progress continue to occur and love it at the same time. I was like, this is something I really need to push all my brakes, like all my gas towards. Gotcha. So. And then when you did start to kind of get more serious, you know, before you looked at a coach and stuff like that, was it getting to the point where you were starting to really think about like competitiveness with this or, was it just let me see, first was it kind of just like, let me see what my body can do, mm-hmm. and then it like you maybe fell into the competitive side of it? Like, for you, where did the kind of the kernel come from to then lead you to where you are now? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I thought, if I'm going to get up on stage like 90% naked, I can't look like a fool out here. So I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right, because, you know, you have to pay. Like, it's not cheap to do a show either. So, like, if I'm going to pay, like overall like 200 300 dollars and for me at the time too like i was in college full-time uh school was the main priority and um like work was like an afterthought and i never came from a position to where i could have like money kind of there so i was balling off of like 150 bucks like a paycheck sometimes so i was like i have to do this right though so I don't want to like cheat myself. So I was like, I need to get a coach. So I also needed a good coach. So Steve just also happened to like have the price point for me to where I could like, you know, work, go to school full time and then pay for him and then train. And it, it was funny. I was like, I was saving up to about like tubs of protein. Like I was like, I would sit there and not spend money for like two weeks. I think I, I don't think I ever mentioned him because I felt bad. I felt like I was like asking for pity, but it was like, um, like I still never missed a payment for him. But it was like, I would sit there and scrounge out like enough money just about like a thirty dollar tub of protein, and like just to be able to afford him. Um, and it's not like he like charges a lot, but in my eyes, but it was like, I knew I needed to do this right. So that's, that's pretty much where it kind of like I was like. If I suck at this, 
then that's okay. Then at least I know, like, I really put my effort towards it. Yeah. I'm going to make sure I look like the best I can, especially, like, if I'm on stage, like, all these people are going to come out to support me. Um, and it, me not knowing exactly how much I would get into it at the time, I was like, let me just shoot at it, you know. And it just so happened to stick and I actually, you know, gained much more of a love than I thought I ever would. That monetary side, I think, is, is very important to understand for the for the new competitors out there that it is a commitment, right? No, I mean, it it's not cheap. I think that's why maybe like influencing has been such like a big trend recently. Yeah, like I think that's why you see like a lot of the new like or even just like pros now, like all of a sudden be really active on YouTube because um, I feel like almost they make more doing that than even like sponsorships, like winning a show, like. That's why the Arnold Classic having the biggest, as big as a you know a prize it did this year for Open. Yeah, that's why you had basically like Olympia two point oh. Yeah, this year is because it's the next highest paying thing besides the Olympia. Me as somebody who's like not even touching like like enhancements, like I couldn't imagine. Like I I kind of know how much enhancements cost, and oh my god, at a professional level, to have as much like <laughs> basically the the prize the money they win. On a pro show, besides like maybe the Olympia or the Arnold, that just covers like their costs for that prep. Yeah, like the only they did that to get their Olympia like qualification. So yeah, like when I was in college, it was like, sheesh, it was like scrounge enough. I remember one time I texted Steve and I was like, "Hey, I haven't had my intro workout protein for like two weeks. I just haven't, and it's like thirty bucks. And I was like, I haven't been able to like afford it for like two weeks." And he's like, that's fine. Like, just let me know. But, like, like, just let me know and we can adjust it. And I was just so embarrassed to be like, yeah, I couldn't buy, like, a bag of protein for, like, 30 bucks. And, but, yeah, it, it's it's definitely a sport to where, like, you can still do it. Like, I mean, I did it. You can still do it, like, mm-hmm. without the money. Like, you can get, like, you know, fattier cuts, cut the, yeah. like, you can, I've seen people buy, like, do away, um, I used to like watch all like the like grocery shopping videos and like ball on a budget videos. So like I remember watching like all of Fuad Abiyat's thing and that's where I got like the whole like whole wheat pasta and like do all this mixture and stuff like that and like like strain your beef, cut the fat parts off chicken thighs, like basically like doing the most you can with as little as you have. Is there anything, any hacks that you specifically remember using or, or maybe even hacks that you kind of like found out on your own or, or, or just like, <laughs> is this going to work? Let me try this one out. Anything like that? So the biggest hack, I wouldn't even say it's like a monetary hack, but it's a prep hack. And I think I'm the only one I think I, I know of that's ever done this. Uh, well, like monetary hack wise, I would say like I would really make things that like tasted good and other things that didn't taste good. So I'll take a lot of like vegetables and stuff like that. Um, and then this, I never actually a big thing I did with a lot was get like, um, like I said, I was doing the effect, if it fits your macros type of like meal plan at the time. And so every night I would make like pizzas, but of course, you know, a regular like pizza is like 300 a slice, like 300 calories a slice. So what I would do is like, I would get like pita flatbreads and then I would weigh out, the amount of like G Hughes barbecue sauce I put onto it. And like, it's funny. Cause like I said earlier, I was like, I told my mom, I would never count all the calories I was eating. So that's why I think it's so funny how ironic this is at this point is I would get like two pita flatbreads, um, weigh out in grams, how much barbecue sauce I used, put that down, put on grilled chicken. Uh, and then like any other vegetables, I didn't count the vegetable calories. Cause like he does and, um, fat free cheese, and I would make that, I would have that, like, every night. And it would literally be, like, what, like, six, 700 calories for two of those. And it was, like, filling. It tasted good. But, like, the big prep hack I have, I told Steve about this, and he laughed at me. <laughs> it was, uh, I call it uh, egg white pizza. Okay. So, I, I love pizza. I didn't love pizza ever. I hated pizza. I didn't really hate it, but I didn't get the hype until my first prep. And now it's, like, one of my favorite foods. And what I did to kind of satisfy that craving, but also, like, when you're, like, two weeks out, we get on prep, like, you're not eating anything. And we do, like, carb cycling for me. So it's, like, I had no carbs. So 
I take my egg whites and my egg yolk if I had it. Or I would pretty much just take my egg whites, pour it in there, and I would cook it and put like the top on. Uh, no, I, I'd, I'd cook it for a second and on high heat a little bit and like cook the bottom. Put my toppings on top like uh, onions, mushrooms, spinach, um, peppers, stuff like that. And then I would take like uh, garlic parmesan seasoning on there too. And then I would take like the top of the pan and then I'd put that on there and then like let it kind of like cook at a lower heat. And so it would heat the top part too. So those toppings I put on like the wet part of the eggs, it would then begin to like basically bake into it. And then I would put like a egg, the whole egg on top last. So it would basically be over easy on top of this like basically firm egg white. And so you cut it like the pizza cutter and it legit holds up. Huh. Like you can hold it, you can cut it in pizza slices, and you can hold it up and it'll hold all your toppings. So like mango salsa with a little bit of hot sauce on that, dude. I was eating like, this thing looked like art. And it was literally just egg whites. He That's like, crazy, yeah. I've never heard of that. Yeah, neither have I. I, I was down bad. So badly. what was it just like, was that just truly an experiment at that point? Or like had you thought about it, thought it out? Or like what drew, Like, what brought you to going to the kitchen and actually trying that? <laughs> yeah. So like I said previously, like I had been like, experimenting with like making different things out of foods that would fit the macros, right? So Steve had me my, my meal plan, and so I would just take what I had off that meal plan, and I was like, how could I, like, it's, with, when you have, like, I was trying to make as much volume as I could. So with my chicken and rice meals, I was like, you can't get much more volume than, like, rice and chicken. Like, you can use potatoes, but you get, like, a quarter of a potato. Like, you can't really do much with that. But I was sitting there, and I was like, what am I doing besides just scrambling my eggs and eating them in, like, two minutes? And so I pretty much just you all those like years of like creating healthy ish like healthy foods and still wanting it to get that same call of quality taste. It was pretty much just like, what if I put up with this together? I mean, don't get me wrong, like there was some couple of failures in there. But uh <laughs> I believe it. Couple couple it especially the playing with the heat. Yeah. Had a couple of burnt pizzas. But yeah. um I, I really couldn't make an omelet, so there was no use making an omelet because I can't flip. I can't even make a pancake. So there was I didn't need any flipping aspect to it. So I was like, what can I do to make it stationary? And I was like, well, if I just you know cook it, I know what happened. I left it one day. Like I didn't like leave it so much that I started smoking, but I was like, I left it and I was like, oh, like, I forgot my eggs in there. And so I go to like try and like you know scoop it out and it's like flat. And I'm like, yo, this is like a pizza base. And then I just threw my stuff on there because I was like, oh, I forgot to like throw my, you know, my stuff in there. And it 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 wasn't exactly like it was. Like it was still kind of like bland. But I was like, next time, like tomorrow night, I'm gonna throw like the mango sauce on there, and it just be kind of slowly came apart. You know what it is. So like, I have pictures on my phone. Like it looks like something you get like at an Italian restaurant. Like it's nuts. That's awesome. So and you can like change the flavors to it. I mean, don't get me wrong. You can't make no like pepperoni pizza or nothing like that with it. But like. If you want to play a little bit like barbecue sauce onto it, the mango salsa, uh, I had like blackberry salsa. So it was not necessarily like a regular pizza, but it was like enough of a free pizza where I was like mentally off of prep. Yeah. Because when you're so deep in the prep and you're like, like I said, like a week out, two weeks out and you're so depleted on food, like, like, like egg yolk takes like chocolate. So it's not, not literally, but like it, it has the same mental like aspect to it. So I'm like, if I can mentally take myself out of prep for like the 10 minutes that I eat this and close my eyes and I feel like a pizza slice and it tastes not like eggs, yeah, then I can go to bed after this and not be like, oh my God, I can't wait till breakfast. Because that, that's pretty much how it was in my first prep was it was just pretty much just exactly how I, it was laid out. And after my last meal, I was like, that's sweet. So I'm going to go to bed now because I'm hungry and I can't wait till breakfast. And it's so happened to make me like my satiation last longer. And so yeah, it, it pretty much killed like two birds with one stone, getting the flavor and also being able to keep me full, you know, before I went to sleep. I mean, other than just like that aspect of it, like 
utilizing the food to, you, you kind of said, take yourself out of prep for that moment. Mm-hmm. Did you do anything else? Did you have any other, are you a personal trainer who wants to scale and grow your business online? Have you been coaching online for years, yet don't know how to incorporate online into your current business model? Introducing Trainer Revenue Multiplier, the premier wealth creation system for fitness professionals that helps you earn more and work less. Visit www.trainerrevenuemultiplier.com today to schedule your free business accelerator session. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level, schedule your call today. Hobbies or like activities or things that you would do to get your mind out of the fact that I'm hungry or I'm really, you know, uncomfortable right now or whatever. Yeah. I know it wasn't playing video games because I tried that for a bit. Some people say they just do that and they take it out of it and stuff like that, but... I tried it, and, like, some nights, my friends joked on me about it because I would be, like, playing, and then I'd be like, all right, I'm getting off. I'm hungry. And I don't know. Like, I, can't, I already ate my last meal. I'm getting off. And, but I think what I think what actually fixed that was going and doing, like, what was it? I think I would go, like, I don't know, like, whenever I went to a concert, it wasn't that bad. I, honestly, it was kind of doing more physical activity, kind of maybe mm. not as hungry, which usually it's in the opposite for people. Yeah. Um. But if I was like, I don't know, yeah, that and like going to like movies and stuff like that, um, something to where I actually like wasn't necessarily focused on what I was doing, yeah. the aspect of like, like if I had a second to like by myself, I would start feeling hungry. But I remember I'd go to a movie and then I'd be fine afterwards. I'd go like, for instance, like activate and stuff like that. You'd be like physically active and I, I would be like not hungry at all and there's also a certain barrier that like once you're so hungry in a day you'll get like a really bad like i don't know if you've ever been there but like you'll get like a really bad like hunger craving and it's like oh my god like my stomach's eating itself and then once you get past that barrier like you just kind of stop being hungry for a bit uh yeah and so like i think that kind of i think that's pretty much what it was is like it was mentally taking me out of it and I would get through that main initial, like, oh, my God, I'm going to starve type of feeling. And so when I got done with it, it I, I, was in the sa- I was in the stage to where it was like, oh, I'm just feeling normal right now. So, so that's obviously, like, a, for bodybuilding, it's a very unique place to put yourself in, mm-hmm. right? I mean, when you look at other sports, it's like, how can we best be fueled and hydrated and mentally there and all these things? It's almost completely opposite for bodybuilding, yeah. right? And having your background with sports, like, was it weird to just, like, know that you're trying to be at this high level, but you also have to be, like, very mentally and physically um, at this kind of, like, really low level or... Um, did people even like around you, like parents or friends or whatever family ever like question, you know, why are you doing this? If you're in this much pain, if you're in this much, you know, uh, angst about my next meal, like, yeah, was that a thing for you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause now they're, they understand it now. So yeah, it definitely was a point to where in the very beginning, I, I was so naive going into it too. I knew what I was kind of signing up for it to a sense, but I was also like, oh, like, and when I did get into it, like I said, I researched a lot. So I, I was a really big fan at that point of like, I was a really big Jay Cutler fan at the time and a really big uh, Lou Ferrigno fan at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, they really went you know, full force into it because um, you know, they were also chasing like the greats at that time. They were chasing Arnold, they were chasing Ronnie, and I was like, you know, put those two in a conversation. So it's like, if they're going to go full force into it, I'm going to go full force into it. So I thought I was going to be like, oh, I just mentally power through it. And I was like, I've been hungry before. Like, it can't be that bad. And uh, I've missed breakfast once. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, and then it's not the same as like eating and then 15 minutes later being like, did I even eat? Yeah. Uh, and then I would, I remember it kind of like when I'm on prep, I get kind of like moody a little bit. And they're going to like joke on me saying, oh, a little, a little bit. Uh but it's just like I get a little moody and I remember at first times it would be like it was kind of like a learning curve if that makes sense. It was like I would come home from work and I don't like necessarily take out, you know, my temper on anybody, but it was I just was quiet. So I would come home and I would just kind of be quiet and they'd be like, Oh, is something happened to work and I'm like, No. 
And they're like, you good? And I'm like, yeah. And it's like, is there anything you want to talk about? No. And it's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm just hungry. And I guess they thought that was an excuse at first. Until it was like four weeks out-ish, my first show. And then I put my stuff in the living room and just go to my room. And they're like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just really hungry. And I guess after so many times of hearing that, it was like, okay. Like, this is, it's not, he's not actually upset with anything. He's just really hungry. And so, like, now, like, the recent prep, because before then they were like, you know, do you want something to eat? Like, or do you really, do you need something? And I'm like, yeah, I want something to eat, but, like, I can't have something to eat. And so, I, I, I but I don't blame them, though, because it's something to where, like, when you don't get into it and you don't really, like, know, even, like, knowing about it, but, like, not being there before, like, my friends, stuff like that, like, I stopped going out to eat with them just because, like, they would go to, like, Buffalo Wild Wings, and it's, like, I can't, especially with hot wings being one of my favorite foods at the time, it was, like, I can't sit there and be around that. Um, Going to Super Bowls and, mm. like, have, like going to these places and, like, smelling this, seeing this, it was, like, tough for me. And they're, like, I mean, it's just one. And it's, of course, I mean, but I don't blame them. Like, I don't get mad for, like, oh, it's just one. Because I know some people get mad about that. But, like, I understand where the aspect of, like, oh, it's just one chip or it's, like, it's just one hot wing. Or, like, it's just one thing. It's not going to really affect you. And that might be true. Like, I'll probably look the exact same way, even if it's two or three. But if I give in to that and I come second because a judge says, you know, you're, like, a week off, then I'm going to think, oh, well, if I didn't eat this then. Yeah. And you know, it's also cheating yourself. And for, in my aspect, it's like, you know, you're you're starving for this, and you're gonna like subside it for like twenty minutes, right? And unless you really indulge, and if you really indulge, and you're really throwing yourself back like two or three weeks, because when you're that lean, like that big of a meal can just blow you up. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it was definitely kind of a learning curve for them. I feel like with kind of responding to how. I physically and mentally was becoming. So like, I mean, like I said, I wasn't like, I was like a mean person or anything, but it was just a lot more reserved, not wanting to go out, um, being less talkative. But now like it's, when we do preps like this past one, these past two in the fall when it was, there's, when they were also seeing me more often. My first prep, I was actually in college in my dorm. So they almost never saw me, but like this past two preps in the fall, I was actually at home. So they got to see me every single day. They got to see the gradual progression. And then it was like when it's like they see me like, Are you okay? And it's like, yeah, I'm hungry. Like, okay. So like they, they, they know it's, that's when it's coming. And then I usually be like, yeah, I'm starting to get hungry more often now. It's coming up. So that's, it's usually like, yeah, that, that time's coming up, you know, yeah. I'm going to start being in that kind of zone. And then that, and then I usually stop getting those questions because it's like, it's it's a collective, like, idea now that we know like, this is like the grind time. So, gotcha. You no, know, and that part we kind of all kind of it kind of like helps all of us out because yeah. it helps us like adjust each other's routines more. Um, yeah, I think now it's kind of like flows together now. It's yeah, like part of a team now. Like, does it feel almost being around other people when you're in that time and, and in that mindset? Does it does it feel easier? Or does it feel harder with other people around, or does it feel the same? I think it's the environment. So, like, my first prep, like I said, I was in a college dorm room, and it was, like, the perfect, like, environment for a bodybuilder because I had just my meals there. I would go home, cook my meals on Sunday, and then bring them to my dorm room and have like a full mini fridge full of meals for like Monday through Thursday. Cause I come back like on Friday morning. And so with that one, it's like I lived in a box. So I would go to class and I, luckily my class was like at like 10 and I would have like one or two. And cause at this point I was like a senior in college. So I wasn't having like a lot of classes, just like my easy prerequisite, like my finishing classes that were pretty easy and, so I would go do that, go to the gym, and then I played uh, club basketball. That was my cardio, basically, too. So 
I'll go do that. And that helped me with my food a lot of times too, because I was doing that rather than being hungry. And then I would come home, eat my meal and go to bed. Like it was, I lived in a box. So, um, and that was great for me. I feel like, because I didn't get to see like, so my, my family likes to the bake a lot. My sister bakes like cookies made oh, from yeah. cake batter. That'd be tough. Oh my God. <laughs> dude. Like it's, you can smell it in my room and it's like, I think that was more of like a mental challenge this yeah. past time because I think the only time I've ever technically cheated on a prep was like, it was like, I, I'm so like embarrassed. I don't, I finally came out about this. It was like, not because it was so bad, but because it was so little, it was, my sister had made like biscuits like the night before, or like the day before. And so like, a, they were like a day old biscuit and like a Ziploc bag. And I remember it was like two weeks out and I'd come home and I was on a weekend and it was like, I had all this food around me. I never touched that. But in my head, I was like, oh my God, I need that biscuit so bad. And then I remember, I remember she, I didn't, she wouldn't have cared if I did it. But I remember I hid the biscuit in like my like pocket, went to my room and I ate it. And I felt awful afterwards. I was like, and it was literally just a biscuit. That thing was like 150 calories, maybe. And like my body probably needed it actually. But um, I never did that. I was like, oh my God, like I just, broke off the trail yeah. that I needed to do. And, and it wasn't, I'm not saying that like it's their fault or anything. Cause I mean, I, I don't want them to like not live their life because I'm doing something. Yeah. But it was the first time where I was like, thinking that I kind of need that like environment. And I, I grew now like this past two, perhaps I was at home and you know, like I used to literally their baking a lot of times and um, they made my favorite food sometimes and stuff like that. So, it just like I was able to kind of like it allowed me I feel like to get more of a challenge, which I think I, I kind of it helped me a little bit more with as well mentally. Yeah, being in a position to where I didn't have a uh, ability to just to not see it. Right, like I was put there right in front of it and able to like turn away for that time. So, yeah, yeah, that biscuit story. It's like I came out about that. I was like, I want to let you know, like I, I had. A, you were talking to me and there was like a biscuit in my pocket, like, like a dry, like nothing. It wasn't even nothing good. There was no honey. It was just dry biscuit. And that was, it tasted like heaven to me, yeah. but yeah, I'd be, yeah. um, yeah. I also tell them too, like, you know, you don't have to do anything different when I'm on prep. Cause like for one, it's even more of a challenge to me. So if I overcome it, then it's great for me and I need to learn how to overcome that as well. Yeah. But I also don't want to put your life on hold because I'm doing something for me. Yeah. Right. So it's like not like you're really getting any benefit out of this. So I don't expect you to like adjust to sacrifice. Me. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty crazy. I mean, it is like what our minds will tell us to do or or sometimes it, I guess it doesn't even feel like you like it doesn't even feel like you did it, I guess. Mm-hmm. It was more of like just like this humanistic kind of um like need or this this like this thing that almost came over you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, whether it's bodybuilding or, or whatever kind of thing it is, like I think we've all been there. Where it's like, oh my god, I can't believe that I did that. Didn't even feel like I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, it was. Which bodybuilding? I mean, it puts you there. It takes you to that limit. <laughs> I mean, and you got to stay there too. Is the crazy part? I feel like when I'm on prep, uh, I tend to stay up a little bit later just because my body is not wanting to go to sleep, and I, I have less dreams. Like when I'm in the off season, it's completely different. Like I dream all the time. It's, um. I think I had like one dream and I think it was like pizza and I think I remember I was eating it and I, I as soon as I realized I was like, you know, this tastes like marinara sauce. I woke up <laughs> and I think that was the worst part is I didn't get, even get to enjoy it yet. That does suck. <laughs> and so, but luckily it was just one because I think after that one too, of course, you know, it's breakfast time as soon as you wake up. So at least you can get over that. We can get that through. But yeah, and prep with me, it's like, I'll, I'll I'll try and go to sleep and like I'll take like you know my melatonin and uh, like really just try and like lay there and it, it still won't do nothing. I'll take magnesium and try and make me relax a little more too. It still won't do nothing. And but like luckily like I'm like asleep, wake up. So, um, but yeah, no, in the off season though, there's a lot more dreams. Uh, but I think it's just because of how much food I'm getting and. 
how much my mind's able to like relax and not be so stressed out and stuff like that. Just getting to work with somebody, you know, like Steve, who is really kind of like an encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to the sport. Yeah. When he was on here, it was just blowing my mind with all the stuff that he, oh, yeah. with all the stuff that he knew about, you know, even going back into like the forties and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm how it started and PEDs in the early days and that's everything. It was like, wow, this, this guy has done so much. Yeah. And you not really having like that, that background in bodybuilding and that like being, you weren't really like a fan beforehand. Was that like a little like weird or shocking or overwhelming at all to be, to have him, I'm sure he's kind of adapted his, his coaching and his like educational talking mm. to, to meet that need with other people as well. But like, at some point too, when we feel like when we know something, sometimes we don't even know that we that other people don't know it. Mm-hmm. Did did it feel weird at all for you to be like be talking to this guy who had all this history and all of this, all these competitors? And I mean, some of the really great competitors locally have have worked with him, and mm-hmm. and then you just come in and like you don't really know that much, and like, hey, I want to do this. Was that weird at all? <laughs> yeah. So it's funny too, because like also like when I chose him, I had no idea of like who he had worked with before. So, like, I came in completely fresh, and when I, as soon as I started, like, researching as much as I could after that, and he's also not a, a I know it was different on the podcast, but, like, typically if you met him in person and, like, checked in and stuff, at least from my experience before, like, my first couple check-ins, it wasn't a lot of talking. Like, we would talk and we would get, like, what we needed to do down, but he's not, like, my first impression was, like, he's not a man of a lot of words. And some people are like that, so I was like, oh, it's fine. Uh, and then I researched more, and then I would just mention stuff about, like, training and nutrition. Because, um, like, a lot of what I researched recently is just, like, training methods, methodology. And then it, it's funny because once you hit, like, a certain, like, note with him, it, it's, like, it'll be, like, a half-hour check, and it'll turn into, like, a two-hour, like, conversation. <laughs> like, uh, uh, for instance, we even on a huge conversation just about, like, training methods and um which ultimately led us to like where our training method is now what we do with our training currently so um but yeah i didn't realize how much of like like you said in the encyclopedia he is yeah um until i started like asking a couple of questions like you know if this certain movement was like done this way would that still be okay or um or even just like, like like you all did in the podcast, like talk about like history of bodybuilding. That also sparked a big conversation between us too. Because um, like at, at the same time too, I told him like, you know, I did Frank Zane's like kind of like a little bit mock of his routine. And Frank Zane saw it and replied to me. And, um, I told that to him. He was like, oh, I'm actually met Frank Zane. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Betty? Uh, That's crazy. But um, yeah, so yeah, um, it's funny because now our, our training style now is kind of modeled after, not exactly like our, our training style is mount, uh, modeled after Dante Trudell, but it comes, has bases of like, like Mincer. And he's like, oh yeah, I went to his uh, seminar. I was like, dude, like you're no, know, all the people like I was like researching and I would be like, you know, what if we did it this way? I saw like Chris Aceto say something about this and he's like, oh yeah, I learned all my stuff from Chris Aceto. Like not all that stuff, but like I learned a lot from Chris Aceto. I have his handbook. So it'd be like, I just basically like mention topics in the aspect that you said about the encyclopedia. Like I would just mention topics, my secrets out now, but like I would just mention topics. And then when he would start like saying names, I would go back and just research names and, um, research like anything that was a point of interest, like a topic. I treat it like it was like a college course and then I just got notes and I go back and do my research on the notes that I had mentally. Wow. So that's where I think also, I think I have a lot of like, more knowledge than I do like way more knowledge than I did previously in the past couple of years is just because I would take little bits that he would say and research on that um, and do best I can. Like look at Chris Aceto's books. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. And so now like we probably got to try and work together, maybe about mentoring a little bit and um, just build more of that relationship just because I know I have so much more to learn still as well. Right. So, yeah. And then, you know, getting to kind of get across reference of like all these people and how they do things. Was it weird for you at all to like, 
be exposed to all that and kind of be like, okay, well, if this person says this, why is this other person saying that? Yeah, yeah, it's it's another thing we did too. That's kind of how it started. It was I was like, oh, you know, I saw this coach say this about this, and actually, I would research like what he had been on previously. So, like, even like a really old podcast that he had been on, like years and years ago. Like, it's not even around anymore. But I'd be like, hey, I remember exactly when we did this too. I was like, hey, I remember back into the podcast here. You said something about this. And I wanted to get more info, like what you said about that, like, and, and just take more about like what he had said previously, and yeah, like cross referencing it, like, of course, like you know, you'll research somebody that he has said, and then see what they had mentioned, and then go back into that, and then you come back and you're like, hey, you know, you said something about this guy, and they said he learned this from this guy, but they said, you know higher fat works here while we're we doing like, you know, our carb or like why we move like carb manipulation when this aspect said, you know, keep your carbs up. And then that's where you really started to learn. Or at least I really started to learn the aspect of like everybody's different. And not only that, but like, even if it's the same body, every prep is different. Right. So like, he's like, yeah, you can do that. Um, I remember like in the off season, I was like, Oh, you know, what? can I do it this way or this way or this way? And that was my aspect of kind of like, is it possible? Uh, and he's like, yeah, you can do it this way or this way or this way. But, you know, it's, it's which way is going to work best. Right. And, 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 so, and so, yeah, that's pretty much that. Yeah, he told me the big aspect of like not every prep is going to be the same. So that's where we kind of, we also kind of pick pieces off of our previous preps. Uh, like we did a lot of this press prep um, and for the uh, Kentucky Open. So we did like, for instance... <laughs> In April, we did a lot of a conditioning look. We did a lot of carb depletion, and we kind of did some uh, water manipulation as well. And we came in pretty uh, pretty conditioned, especially for a natural show, um, just slightly flat. And then we went to the uh, August 12th show, and based on like kind of what like was the judging was supposed to be like, a little bit more of like the more classic look. So. Um, not necessarily like bone dry, striated, but like, you know, still kind of full and that, that classic like seventies look. Yeah. So they weren't like peeled, like striated glutes, like, but they were still like pretty lean. So we did that and it came a little bit more fuller. Uh, and so then, and that was a completely different, like, not completely different, but like as far as like how we did it at the end, it was different than April. And so for the 19th show, which was a week later at the open, it was like, okay, we know how to get you looking dry on stage. We know how to make you look full on stage. If we just merge those two together now, and that's what we did, I ended up looking really pretty dry, uh, as well as like relatively full against people who, you know, have more of a chemical advantage than I do. Right. So, um, and I didn't look like I got smoked at all, in my opinion. So, um, just learning that, going through that with him, I think, really kind of opened my eyes in the aspect of like taking every little bit that you've done previously and putting it together. Yeah. And then him kind of showing me like the highlighted portions, like you did this differently. And then us also kind of not only me being like, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But like me being like, for instance, what we did in this past prep was more water. So it was like, Hey, you know, we put a lot of water in this press show. What if we did that? And this did April's prep just add a little bit of water. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. And so it's like a, it's like a teamwork type of thing. Right. And I think that's what works well with him. It's not like, well, it's not what I said, so you're not going to do it. It's like, he'll take input. That's what I think works a lot too. Right. And then it feels like it's your plan too. Yeah. It makes you really kind of also focus on a harder. Cause at that point it's not like, oh, I can't be like, oh, it's what he said. And I had to follow exactly what he said. And I, he it's still screwed up. So it's his fault. So it's like if I, if I screw up, it's like I also like it could have been what I did that screwed it up. Yeah. So I have to really make sure it works so he can take my input again. Yeah. Somebody who also wanted to like as like like look into like coaching and stuff like I'm also like you know coaching stuff like that. So it's like I'm like I respect people who like do stuff that they suggest like they practice what they preach. And so I'm like if I want to you know kind of like make my own like kind of like peak plans. I'm, I'll suggest it, and then if it works, I can see how much I can really gauge a body. 
Right. And so and it just so happened to work out pretty well with it. So, um, and even with clients now, like if I ask like a question about like, you know, we're doing this, like, is it good? And he's like, well, I don't know them, but, um, he'll, he'll still like be willing to like help me out a little bit. And that's why I like a lot too, is like, he, he's still willing to give you a helping hand. Like he helps a lot and not just like, which you're doing your plan, but like if you have questions about anything else, like he's always there to just try information. That's cool. Do you, do you feel like you're kind of like your own experiment too at some, at times? Yeah, actually that seems, that's kind of what we're doing now in the off season now is, uh, actually I went on the cruise and, and you know, I said I kind of ate a little bit more. I probably should have. Um, I mean, I didn't go like crazy, crazy overboard, uh, except for that one night I had two pounds of seafood, but, <laughs> uh, but like, no, I, I, I did that too. I was like, I know I'm, I'm on a cruise ship. I don't, you know, I'm not at the factory right now, so I don't have, you know, ax squats, stuff like that. So, I really had to like take what I know and apply it. And so I applied more of like a, uh, a high intensity, um, but really strict form, uh, kind of method and, uh, using things like rest pauses, drop sets, but not too much into volume. And I, I legit, like my legs look a lot different in August than they did in April. Um, uh, the size was a little bit more of a different look, even though food really didn't increase at all. So, yeah, I think, and then that's why I told him, I was like, yo, like, I went on this cruise, and even though it was a week, like, we saw changes. Hmm. So, um, I applied that training change to more of, like, a heavier weight, but still enough to where that form really is surgical. Yeah. And, um, like I said, my legs looked the best they ever did August 19th. So that's where now, instead of like last year, we have more of like a high volume training style. This year we're doing like a dog crab DC, you know, Dante Trudell style training. And like my shoulders already look way better in the rear. Um, Last growing. um, Like all the spots to where it needs to grow is already growing. And we're only like a little over a month in. So, yeah, I think if it wasn't for like me kind of like, testing a little bit about training styles and because remember we talked about it a lot and we would like we followed the same people on instagram so it's like hey did you see them post about like what they posted today and it's about kind of like what we were talking about with this training style and he's like yeah uh when we get in the off season you're gonna do that and so and i was kind of like i remember i was like that's all i text and i was like sweet like i can't wait now i was like we're still in prep and i'm like i can't wait for the off season so we can start this now and yeah, it, it's working. So I can see us probably doing this for a long while because now we're actually like, I'm giving input when I'm seeing stuff differently, and he's responding to that and adapting what I'm doing now to my own responses. So it's kind of like like it's, it's like a synergy almost. Yeah. So I'm giving him the pieces, and he's kind of like putting them in position to where they work. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, just curious on a. Last time we went on a cruise, I didn't go to the gym. What's their gym like? Is it just kind of like a hotel gym? or Honestly, it's like a little bit better than a hotel gym. They don't have, like, the only free weights they have is, like, dumbbells. And so, like, legit for, like, like legs and stuff like that. And it, it's also, like, pretty much, like, what you see, a little bit less than what you've seen in Planet Fitness. So, like, legs, I'm making, like, RDLs in, like, different fashion because they only go up to 70 pounds and it's, like, I'm really extra, like executing a really deep hip hinge in my RDLs. Um, really, it's really the form I was really emphasizing there, because you can only have like so much weight, and you know they really don't like set up their gyms for people who like who really push weight, right? Because that's typically not who their audience is. So right. it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not sitting here thinking, well, you know, this kid's, you know, he's pushing this much weight here, so we need to give him like, you know. 16 plates just for one thing like and there's no plates so it's like you get all machines so it's like if it only goes up to so much weight then you either have to drop like slow down your timing or do more reps and that's what i wanted to do i just you know slowed down my reps um increased the weight as much as i could just to kind of compensate and like legs like you know practicing like more hip hinging and um you know, focusing more on like what the muscle is feeling like rather than getting the number um, because I can't get enough weight to get to a certain number. 
Yeah. So if I shoot for the number, it's going to be too light. So right. Being a, a natural athlete, what really led you into wanting to to do that? So I think, yeah, yeah, a big part of it would be the, um, the thought of like what it could be like. So it's like, uh, my body's changing currently. I'm seeing you know positive results, and if I have potential here, like I don't want to waste it. So that's kind of what started the idea. And then I would look through and be like, and of course you have that realization of like, oh my God, like 90% of the industry is on steroids. So it's like, you know, at first that's kind of like a, uh, a shocking moment to hear, but then it's like, okay, there's still people who can do it naturally. And if I'm already looking like this two or three years in, and I'm like, like for instance, last off season really gave me a big um, drive confidence boost because it's like I put on 10 pounds leading tissue in a year, like eight months I was really injured for like a couple months with uh sciatica we took us out for like two or three months of off season and so really with the eight months we had we put on like leading tissue of like 10 pounds and so I was like you know I'm a natural athlete doing that so if the potential is here like I don't want to jump straight into gear right um and no disrespect to anybody who does um but I'm thinking if I do this for like 10 years naturally at least and I did what I did in one year naturally like the potential I could have and I'm already sitting like a stage lean like 180. So if I'm thinking oh if I do this for like three or four more years put on like at least 20 more pounds of like lean tissue like I'm already pushing like same weights to other dudes who aren't natural on stage. So, and although I might not, you know, may not get the same amount of progression as I did my first off season, um, as it goes, of course, it'll probably slow down over time. But I was like, if I can be in that same ballpark naturally, like I want to see if I can do it, because um, not a lot of people are even patient enough to do that. Right. Yeah, and it seems like patience is uh, is a big motivator when it comes to using something. This podcast is sponsored by Smoking Gun Coffee, a veteran-owned coffee company that strives to give back to those in need. Don't forget to use code TWR10 for a 10% discount at checkout. Yeah, yeah, I I know exactly what you mean. Like, because that's even, like, one of the biggest critiques I've had was, like, muscle maturity, of course, because it's, like, I'm still relatively, like, in the grand scheme of things, I'm still, like, a newborn baby in bodybuilding. Right. So, like, of course my muscles aren't, like, as striated in the chest and stuff like that as other competitors are. And it does kind of, and what you see on social media and stuff like that, you're kind of like, oh, this kid's like 19, and he's way more straighter than I am, bigger than I am, and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't know what he's taking. So, like, you always, you do kind of always have that thought, like, you know, if I did touch stuff, like, you could, you could probably, you know, really drastically increase what kind of competitor you are right now in a short period of time and then just keep going. But for me, it's like, I really kind of want to see what my body's capable of. So say, for instance, I started tomorrow and I become somebody who's like really, really great in the sport. I still kind of always will probably have that thought in my mind. Like if I didn't touch it, like would I still be kind of where I am relative today? Like, is it like, would I be the kind of same way whether I did it or not? Right. Um, Cause like I could just be like a okay responder to it and get some side effects. I might not like and still, have the same end goal or the same end result. Yeah. And I also kind of wanted to be that person to be like, oh, yeah, I look like this, and it's just genetics. I think the kind of stuff about that too is like at this point, it's not like I can just increase the dosage and get more faster results or change, like a different type of look as far as like dryness or anything like that or fullness just by changing the dosage. Like I'm literally dealing with the cards that I'm like dealt. So it just kind of builds some frustration. Sometimes it's like, oh, like, I'm not looking as dry as like so and so on stage, or like you know, uh, I'm like five, I'm like five percent body fat, but like they're five percent body fat, and like you can see their veins up and down, mm-hmm. and 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 it's like and they can't play the car like you know they're the same age as me, and they've been doing it for just as long. Like, why, why can't I get that kind of separate, like same look? But it's you know, if if I keep doing this the same way I am now, then 
I'll probably appreciate it a lot more in the long run because everything I built was built by me. And that's like no disrespect for my who touches it because I hate it just as much as the next person and somebody who's like only look like that because they're on gear. Or like, though, they look like that because they're on gear. and they. But if they didn't take it, they would look like, you know, like me. And I'm like, no, they wouldn't. They put in like twice as much work. As me. So like, don't get me wrong. Like, there's no disrespect to that because it's like, I know even with the gear, like, there's more hunger cravings. There's more, um, like, physical aspects that, like, are tougher than I get. Uh, and even mentally, sometimes it's tougher than it is for me. Um, so I know it. Like, it's 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 still, like, a super hard struggle either way. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of, like, what I think, too, as far as, like, the human potential aspect to it. It's, like, I kind of, like, and, and it's realistic, too, as well. It's, like, you know, I'm not, not I don't think anybody's going to really win the Olympia natural. Like, unless it's, like, I don't know, some genetic freak who just so happens just to have, like, a crazy testosterone level just naturally. So, like, yeah, I'm definitely realistic in the aspect of, like, like, yeah, I could maybe do some pretty good stuff with this, but, like, let's be honest, I'm probably not going to make top three Olympia or anything like that. Like, I don't think really almost anybody is unless they do touch that. Like, even Ronnie, when he was supposedly, like, you know, claimed natural, um, like, he still was, like, not, I think he barely, or he was just outside the top ten. So, like, that just shows, like, the, just the level, like, and even then, like, even taking stuff, like, you have to be, like, the top, like, one zero 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 point one zero 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 percent genetic elite yeah. to even be in that top ten. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a, a very small, small class regardless, but does it ever kind of get, uh, I don't want to say tough, or does it ever get, like, do you ever almost get a little frustrated when people do try to claim that natural status when it's like, they're probably not, or, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because it's just like, it's it's known in bodybuilding, right, that people are doing it. It's it's a little bit more of a like a spoken about thing now than maybe it ever has been. But like, um, there are those people out there who claim it or who leave it up in the air. They don't necessarily say they are or not, you know. So to you being like this this athlete who takes pride in it and who is doing it this way, and then there's people out there who say they're doing it a certain way when they're not. Does that ever get kind of frustrating? Yeah, like, because I know, like, back then, that was, like, kind of a thing because I think in the early 2000s, it was a big thing because it was really big frown appellant and uh, insulin was a really big issue at the time, too, as well. So, like, I, I knew why they did it. But nowadays, it is it is kind of, like, really out in the open. And yeah. so everybody's more open about it. And it's, like, we're all realistic now. Like, we know, like, if you're 250 lean, like, we're, like, come on. Like, you know, and so it's, like... And so it does kind of like still because kind of aggravating because it's like I th- it's like do you, like, it's, it's for people who know what the sport's like it's like even if you take gear and you look really really crazy like we know how hard it is like you can't just like take gear and then automatically like like this yeah so it's like we know what it's like like we know what you have to go through to look like that with it or without it regardless um and so to say like you know if you do take it and then like, even if it's TRT, uh, you've taken it and then, like, saying, oh, like, 100% natural, like, it, like you got to think, like, there's also, like, 13-year-olds and, like, 14-year-olds now, like, will be like, oh, so I can do that. And when they don't get like that, I mean, of course, you know, that also is genetic hand they're dealt, but, like, it's kind of putting, like, unrealistic goals a hand like that. For sure, yeah. And so, like, that's what kind of, like, you know, for instance, like, Sam Slug's a really big thing right now. But he's kind of open about it. And so, like, everybody, like, loves him now. But it's, like, the level, it also brings a new level of transparency to it. So it's more of, like, a genuine, I always see it more of a genuine look to it. Um, but there also is, like, a double-edged sword to it. Because, like, now it's, like, you'll see, like, kids, like, 16, like, like taking whatever. Like, I know, like, trends, like, the big trendy drug right now. So, like, They'll always joke about like taking trend or some kids like I remember like on you know social media like will actually like take trend and stuff like that. And it's like that's like one of the worst drugs to take. Like as far as like mentally what it does to you. So like because that's like the one of the only few drugs besides maybe like super droll or something like that that like I've heard like people like mentally like mentally change. Like when you think of white rage, you think of like trend effects. Um stuff like that, like that's the drug I've heard people like really like freak out the most on. 
Really? And it's the most popular one. Yeah. Um, like everybody jokes about like the trimbaloni sandwiches and stuff like that. So like, <laughs> like, like, uh, so yeah, I think the double edged sword is that too. Now but the, it being so like transparent now, kids also are like, you know, 15, 16 now, like not even like fully like grown chemically. Yeah. That's crazy. Taking stuff. And then they, they do it now and then they'll come like 25, 26 and it's like all their hormones are shot. Right. Because they decided to blast when they weren't even, like, adult yet. That's crazy to think, yeah, a kid taking anything like that. Honestly, I think one of the talks that me and Steve had, actually, that, like, really kind of, like, made me for sure in my thoughts was we were sitting there talking, and we were like, okay, right now, like, right now with how early I am in my career as far as bodybuilding goes, like, Say, for instance, I took drugs right now as far as, like, any kind of, like, chemical enhancements. I'd probably be making the same results as I would be naturally right now because I'm so early. You know, I haven't maxed my genetic limit. And I've always been told, like, it's a grown man's sport. Like, I mean, don't expect to be coming here, like, 20 years old and become an IFPB pro. Right. Like, unless you're, like, Nick Walker, who's, like, still in like early 20s. But, you know, he's a genetic. He's called a mutant for a reason. Right. Like, Like, it's... If I were to be on now and, you know, continue doing what I'm doing, then I'd be making the same gains as I would just a little bit faster, but I would cap out quicker, you know, in comparison to, you know, if you stayed natural for 10 years. Right. And then maybe you thought about doing it. And then you know, the extra little bit more of, you know, genetic reach you could get. So it's kind of like they, it's just such like a, I want something right now type of thing. And don't get me wrong. I'm like somebody who's like, I want it right now. Like, I'll buy it in store for more just so I don't have to wait for shipping. Like I'm just as much of a, like I want it right now type of person than anybody else. But like maturing in the sport kind of also is when you start realizing like right now, getting it right now might not be the best outcome for you. Yeah. And the patience and knowing that it's like, it's a grown sport. Like there's a reason why a lot of champions right now are like mid to late thirties. Yeah. Like they've been doing this. They have like, foundation and some like right like it's, it's a lot of people like especially right now in the state age of like wanting it right now and wanting it so quick and instant gratification and some results mm-hmm. like it's slowing down and taking the steps to like look at the process and then being able to enjoy like every little milestone you hit because i know like a lot of people especially me is like oh if i started this at 16 like i'll be so much better like with what i know or like even like with what i didn't know it's still just starting earlier like I could be so much better now. And like, even me, who's like, who started at like 20, like it's still with like pretty young in, in the realm of bodybuilding. So it's like yeah. me still like starting pretty early. I'm like, dude, if I would have started this at like 17 or 18, like I could be like two or three, cause two or three years is like good amount of time that you can grow still. So I was like, dude, I'd be so, I could be like 190 right now, 195 lean. Like I could be competitively like in a state level, but like, yeah, it it just sucks because, like, you know, you really can't really start growing like that maybe until, like, you're about, like, 15, 16. Right. And grow, stuff like that. So it's, like, it does kind of suck that you kind of have that genetic, like, beginning pays. At least mm-hmm. where it's, like, where, like, if you're, like, a professional athlete, like, basketball player is, like, able to get their kids, like, professional, like, grade trainers at, like, 10. <laughs> right. And then, like, even if they don't necessarily go to the league, like, they're still pretty freaking good. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, like, I, 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 it would be pretty cool to have that kind of, like, um, time frame, but like, it's bodybuilding is also such like a demanding sport, yeah. both physically and mentally. That I think it also is like, I guess it could also be a good thing in that aspect that you aren't really able to progress before a certain age because then you like you won't have like those friends, those parents that might throw them in there and like all they know is bodybuilding since like five years old. <laughs> and with it being such a demanding sport, like I said, both physically and mentally, like, they won't have a childhood because they've been you know mm-hmm. devoting their bodies to that and they didn't even know if they liked it yet that's true it does kind of keep it a little bit more, more pure in that way yeah yeah like i never really hear like a story i mean i'm sure it's happened but i never really heard a story of like oh my dad forced me to do bodybuilding <laughs> right. like i've heard plenty of like oh my dad forced me to do this or like my parents forced me to do this and that and then you know i just kind of do it because you know it's all i knew but like with bodybuilding like you said it's always kind of something to where like i found it on accident mm. and it just so happened to be like very treasure yeah that makes sense yeah i think it is that for a lot of people yeah like it definitely adds like 
seeing how much being consistent shows in your life. Um, and even just like, like, even when I found it, I was still in a pretty dark place. So like when I found it, like that consistency really kind of like showed the light. And like, even like in the pros gym, I don't know to the pros gym for the Arnold classic this past year. And it went into like the, like the dark posing room, like underground. That's like hard to find. And I somehow found it. And like, even, <laughs> yeah, we couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. Like there's like the one upstairs and then like, it's like, okay, this is the one upstairs, but there's not the one with the writing on the wall. Then I wanted to go with all the writing on the wall where all like the pros take their photos at because it's super sick there. And so I was like searching up and down and saw somebody leave a hallway and went in there. And it's like a little miniature like posing room with weights. It's so cool. It looks like a dungeon. But like it has all this writing on the wall. And like actually that's where I found one like the writing on the wall it was like bodybuilding saved my life. Nice. And so like, yeah, it, it's it's usually something that like that's see like usually like you find it on accident and it's like a blessing in disguise you never saw. Yeah. Um, just because the ability to like take control of what you, of what your life is like, um, I, even though it might just be like physically, mm-hmm. um, being able to like change it, but also being able to change like your mental, um, this and that, this in the realm of like bettering yourself. And so I think both those going hand in hand, like, I think definitely, like, improves just the quality of life a lot of people I know of just because, like, they realize how much what they do matters to them. Yeah. yeah it kind of gives everything, like, a new sense of, of value. Like, okay, this waking up really, like, at this specific time really now matters to me, and this food really now matters. Like, it gives everything, like, a, a sense of meaning. And I think, I think it's, it's, like I said, it's grown, you said it's grown in a good way, too, as well. Um, like, now there's a lot more opportunities for people to compete. Um, I know that, like, now, like, uh, at least in the natural realm, like, OCB is coming to Kentucky a lot now. Um, they just had their first show this past year. Um, NGA is really growing a good bit. Um, and I know, um, I think it's A and B F is growing a lot. Um. So it's it's not just being like, oh, there's like 10 things you can go to. Um, there's more of like one that could be like closer to you and also in the same like kind of ballpark that you're going for. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty good too in the aspect that like it's not so centralized as well anymore. So um, like there's more opportunities for like different variables like in uh, competitions like with the prize money you know now. Um, like with different federations, there's more prize money. I know um, OCB pays a pretty good bit for the Yorton Cup. And then um, NGA, I think, pays a pretty good bit too. So, like, there's still ways that you can, if you, you don't have to necessarily be like a top 50 Olympia or it's like a top 50 like bodybuilder to like at least see some like fun experiences in there anymore. Right. Yeah, that is really cool. But, uh, man, it was really great getting to chat with you tonight. I appreciate you coming in Mm -hmm. and kind of sharing a little bit about your experience. I don't have fun. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And if you want to, before you head, if you want to share any socials or anything like that, you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really, the only thing I'm all in right now is uh, Instagram, Um, Timmy underscore O'Keefe. That's pretty much it. If you're tired of searching for a coach or trainer, somebody who knows what they're talking about and has experience, make sure you go check out the new Coach's Corner on weightroompodcast.com. You can find quality, qualified coaches to help you achieve your goals, whether that's in bodybuilding or just general fitness. Stop wasting time and start achieving your goals today. The link to the Coach's Corner is down in the description below.